Hello everyone. Good to be back with you all. Uh, a little bit less crazy weather, though it is still cold here in Bloomfield Hills. Um, thanks, my sister, for this beautiful scarf. Um, I'm your curator, Kevin Adkison, here with another Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research Live at Five. And let's see if everyone is still there. Um, if you're just joining us today, welcome. Um, we do these tours every Wednesday on Facebook Live at five o'clock. And you can go back in time and you can see my earlier tours of the sculptures at Cranbrook Art Museum, the architecture and ornament of Kingswood School, and friends and visitors of Sarnen House. Those are all on our Facebook page. Today, the topic of our subject is uh, a place that is near and dear to generations of Cranbrook uh, students and parents and members of the Bloomfield Hills and Cranbrook communities, Brookside School Cranbrook. And Brookside School is a little different from every other Cranbrook institution in that there is no um, international architectural superstar associated with Brookside School. Um, it is really a project of the Booth family uh, and a demonstration of the Booth's dedication to the arts and crafts movement and the Booth's dedication to beauty and education and really to this uh, community here in Oakland County. So. Uh, Brookside School gets its start um, out of the Meeting House, and I'll turn the camera around just to orient everyone as to where we are. Um, we're standing on the corner of Lone Pine Road and Cranbrook Road, and it was at this corner that George Booth uh, built his house uh, up on the hill, and you could have actually seen it up on the hill. Uh, in the early years because there were no trees. Um, and on this corner, there's a little marble table up at the top of the hill, uh, which is where George Booth's um, uh, father, Henry Wood Booth, would teach Sunday school lessons. There's Jake, public safety. Um, and so Henry Wood Booth would teach Sunday school lessons to the local farmers and the local kids. Uh, and he was doing that as early as 1904, well before the Booths moved up to Cranbrook in 1908. Uh, so Henry Wood Booth would teach and he would have tent revivals in the summer. But by 1918, it became clear that they needed to have a more permanent location for church services and community meetings. And so George Booth, designed and constructed the Meeting House. Uh, at the time, there were actually roadways on both sides of the street. You can see the, uh, the uh, remainder of the old Cranbrook Road running there. Uh, George Booth would eventually donate this side of the property to the city, and so the city street stays on this side of the waterway. Uh, when George Booth designed the Meeting House, uh, he designed it to be constructed out of the leftover material from the Cranbrook House Library, West Wing. And the West Wing was finished in the summer of 1918. Uh, and very shortly after that, uh, George Booth designed this uh, uh, meeting house with the leftover material. You can see that the stone around the base is that uh, famous Bloomfield Hills granite, uh, which is all of Cranbrook's walls are made out of. Uh, and then you can see that the half timbering and plaster is the same material and same aesthetic as Cranbrook House. Now, Brookside takes its name from the uh, spur of the River Rouge. That's actually in three sections here. So we have the middle section here, another section of the river joining, uh, and then there's a whole nother section of the river on this side of the road as well. We'll move over to this side. Now, in the early years, uh, Brookside, as a meeting house, um, had a uh, number of different purposes. On Sunday, they would have Sunday school lessons from Henry Woodbooth. There were no churches up here. Uh, and then during the weekday, starting in 1919, uh, they began having day school classes. And the day school classes, um, in the beginning, it was just the Booth grandkids who were attending school here, the Booth's chauffeur and the Booth's gardener's children. So it was uh, really a school for the private estate. 
that would all change in the spring of 1922 uh, when Grace Booth Wallace, who was the youngest or the middle daughter of, the, of George and Ellen Booth, formed the Bloomfield Hill School. Uh, and the Bloomfield Hill School was an elementary school here. Uh, it was led by Jesse T. Winter, who we'll talk a little bit more about. Jesse Winter was the headmistress of the school from 1922 until 1961. So a full 40 years she led the school. Uh, you can see here the original plaque of Brookside, the meeting house erected in the year 1918. Uh, and if you look at the way that the type, the script is set in this block, it's very much uh, reminiscent of English arts and crafts book printing. Uh, the way that meeting is divided across two lines uh, and even the text uh, uh, typeface, the, the font, of the words is very much influenced by William Morris and the Kelmscott Press. And uh, George Booth was a newspaper publisher, and so he was very interested in arts and crafts presses, and he was very interested in um, uh, sort of the, te the, the text and, and work of William Morris. Now, what is really strange about this school is that we have a 319 acre campus and yet our elementary school you can see how close i am to the road and the doorway uh, this was really built before the road was paved and it was certainly built before there was traffic in the region and when jesse winter started teaching here in 1922 she would take the interurban electric that ran from detroit to pontiac she would hop on south of Birmingham, take it up to Lone Pine Road, and then she would walk the mile from Woodward Avenue to the, uh, to the meeting house, or she would catch a ride with the milkman. Uh, and so it was really a very rural school here when there were just seven students in uh, the early 20s. In the summer of 1922, uh, George Booth decided to add an addition onto Brookside. Uh, and the addition is this building here. Uh, it added eight more rooms onto the school, which you can't really um, see how there could be eight rooms there, uh, but there are more rooms underneath the building. And then in 1925, um, or 1924, he built the Ram House, which those of you who went to Brookside know the Ram. The Ram is in front of what were called Ram hydraulic pumps, and that is why it was called the Ram House. Uh, and then in 1925, this portion of the school was put on, uh, which gave the school its first dining room. Uh, and so the building sort of grows and grows over time, reaching up to this, uh, uh, towards Woodward Avenue, moving north along the site. Now, the best part of the 1922-1923 editions are these amazing carvings um, that originally would not have been painted. Um, the paint comes later in the uh, 1950s or 60s. These are carved by Joachim Youngworth. Um, and Youngworth was a, a German wood carver who was practicing in Detroit. You can see some of his scar carvings um, at the Detroit Athletic Club and at the Guardian Building. Uh, and he did a mostly sort of traditional baronial wood carving. But here he does this very whimsical series of Mother Goose rhymes. So you have Jack and the Beanstalk, or Jack and Jill went up the hill here. Uh, you have the grape leaf pattern, and then you have Mother Goose flying on her goose. And then finally you have Peter Pumpkin, uh, Peter, Peter Peter Pumpkin Eater. And then above them are the hand-painted decorations by Catherine McEwen. And Catherine McEwen uh, is most famous around here for her magnificent uh, frescoes at Christchurch Cranbrook. Here she does these uh, sort of inspired by Renaissance tapestries uh, with the deer and the doe and then the birds around the side. And then up at the top you see the, um, the, the top piece with the grape leaves again, Mother Goose reading, the little boy, I don't know, kind of looks like he's throwing a spitball but I don't think that's what he's doing. Uh, and then 1923 carved in the center. And George Booth was doing these uh, carvings uh, to make his building look uh, very traditional in this sort of English village, this English craftsman village that he was assembling down the road. Uh, and if you don't know as much, I know there is a lot of traffic. 
Um, if you don't know that much about the English arts and crafts movement, it started in the 1880s as a reaction against industrialization in Britain. Uh, and in the English arts and crafts movement, it was extremely political. It was a workers' movement. It was a socialist movement. Uh, it came to America by the 1890s, and in 1895, the Boston Society of Arts and Crafts was established, and that was America's first society of craftsmen, architects, and designers who were dedicated to handcrafting tradition. Uh, and so they were people who were committed to building things with their own hand, to not using machines, and as such, they also looked before the Renaissance. The arts and crafts movement really does not like the Renaissance, which is, of course, a revival of uh, of styles, of, of neo-Greek and neo-Roman art. And so the arts and crafts movement of the turn of the century was looking back towards medieval times, towards the Middle Ages, not the Dark Ages, uh, but towards the beauty of handcrafting in the sort of artisanal cathedral village. I mentioned that Boston was the first society of arts and crafts. George Booth was actually a founding member of that society as not a patron, but as an iron worker. So George Booth made his first fortune in iron and his uncle was uh, uh, the founder of the Harvard Graduate School of Design um, and are, are, are somehow affiliated with the Harvard Graduate School of Design. George Booth was involved in Boston society and he helped to establish their society of arts and crafts. In 1905, George Booth delivered a rousing speech that, if you read it, is a little bit of a ripoff of John Ruskin, kind of word for word, but still a good speech, um, in 1905, begging Detroit to establish its own society of arts and crafts, which it would establish in 1906. George Booth was a patron and elected president of the society. And I think it's really interesting that here in Detroit, we had this society of hand craftsmen who were dedicated to things like carving little wooden objects and doing um, decorative painting in the middle of the auto revolution. Unlike the English arts and crafts, ours was never a political movement. And George Booth really saw these things as sympathetic, that you could have high industry and high arts and crafts. Of course, Cranbrook, uh, the art academy, starts its original name as the Cranbrook Arts and Crafts Studios. And today, the Detroit Society of Arts and Crafts is the College of Creative Studies. And George Booth helped to establish the School of the Arts and Crafts as well. I give you all that history just so you have a little bit more context of what George Booth was looking at when he wanted to build Brookside. He wanted it to be like a medieval village and he wanted it to be excellent in construction and handicraft. And I think that the school has maintained all of those traditions. Uh, the next wing that gets put onto the building, uh, this is actually because the school expanded again with a fireproof structure around 1927. And so these barge boards date back to 1923. They were originally on the back of the school and then they get moved up to the front. And again, we see mother uh, goose rhymes and it's the same Austrian carver, um, Joachim Jungwirth. Uh, and you see different scenes moving around recently, a trucks that took some of these out, which is why we have preservation and recarving. And you can see there the goose eating this sort of berry vine that runs up. And then if you look in, this is called half timbering. That's half of a tree in traditional construction. And then you use lathe and plaster construct, uh, lathe and plaster between it. Very traditional construction. And it is quite interesting. The original meeting house is all timber and stone construction. Uh, as the building moves down, we become steel and concrete fireproof construction. And so this is just a false front. Moving inside, we have uh, the rams of the ram house. So these are paintings of the ram sculpture that is inside. Uh, the original ram sculpture was carved in 1916 for the Rainbow Fountain by Marcus Burroughs. But George Booth moved it here to the ram's house in 1924 because of those ram hydraulic pumps. Uh, I love these doors in the way that you have two different widths of muntins. So muntins are what are holding the glass here. Uh, and this is something that's coming direct from Aelial Saarinen. And I used to always say that um, 
Eliel Saarinen inspired Henry Booth, who designed these doors. But then I found something in archives that was a big door switcheroo in 1941. And I kind of think these might actually be Eliel Saarinen doors that were moved here because they are constructed different from every door at Brookside and they're constructed identical to the ones over at the Art Academy. So either these are inspired by Eliel Saarinen, who loved to create these sort of uh, geometries and designs using different Munton sizes, or these are actually Aelial Sarnin. Looking inside, the inside of Brookside is just as whimsical as the outside, and maybe one day we'll do another tour um, through its rambling halls. But let's keep moving down Cranbrook Road. Um, as, my, as we move down, uh, we see here the current dining room, which has light fixtures designed by um, Henry Booth. Uh, and little booth sayings around the walls. And those chairs there were designed and built at the Art Academy uh, by Dan Hoffman, who was then the head of the architecture department at the Academy of Art. As we keep moving down, we're seeing addition after addition after addition. Um, essentially every year from 1918 to 1929. Uh, now this window is interesting because uh, this window which I'm curious as to what piece is missing, but this steel frame window uh, actually dates back to 1923 when the building only dates to 1929. Uh, 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 and this window was built as the aviary window at Cranbrook House. And so there was a birdcage on the front of Cranbrook House where George Booth had his two blue and yellow macaws, Jack and Mac. Uh, they once ate a hundred finches that George Booth put in the cage to try and keep the macaws from eating his books and woodwork. Um, the macaws were eventually de uh, donated to the Belle Isle Zoo. George Booth disassembled his bird cage at Cranbrook House and reused the window here. And so George Booth was the architect of the meeting house. The middle section, he was working uh, as the architect alongside Marcus Burroughs, who is the architect who built um, the police station and the public library in downtown Birmingham, Michigan. Uh, and then by this point, we are seeing just the work of Henry Booth, who was George and Ellen's youngest son, studied architecture at the University of Michigan, graduated in 1922 from the studio of Aliel Saarinen, who was teaching at Michigan. And so you see Henry Booth's influence of Saarinen with things like this chimney where you see the brickwork is turned and tapered in and then sort of multiplies towards the top. It's a, it's a uh, I mean, it is the Art Deco here at our medieval English village. And it's the very particular strain of Art Deco that Aliel Saarinen would use. Now, in the 1929, the major addition, again, it's a fireproof building, and so there's no longer the wooden half timbering, but you see the brickwork that's sort of uh, giving you the same visual design of uh, plaster within the brick lines between. And then we get to the magnificent Brookside Tower, which is, I think, the sort of iconic beauty shot of Brookside School. Uh, this is Henry Booth's design. Henry Booth traveled around Europe uh, in the uh, summer of 1921-22 and again uh, after his wedding in 25. And so he was looking at Scandinavian architecture. He loved German architecture. And so the whole uh, tower here is less of a sort of English church tower or English city hall and more like a, a sort of Germanic, um, Austrian, uh, Sweden, this whole sort of uh, Germanic Central European style with this tapering of the brick, this very subtle tapering of the brick. And then on top of it, you have the painted woodwork. And I believe that this woodwork always has been painted in that much more subtle green, red, and then the brown paint. The bells across the front, uh, they have always been there, but not always those bells. Those are a 19, uh, late 1990s iteration of the original bells that were removed. Um, and those were made by James Starr, who is a metalsmith uh, working out of Pontiac. Um, and he also did those wonderful light fixtures on the north porch of Cranbrook House. And he's a graduate of the Art Academy metalsmithing department. Now, as we look at the front of the school, um, 
we have these great Henry Booth designed light fixtures. Uh, Henry Booth was inspired by the uh, arts and crafts as well. He never abandons it. Cranbrook never will abandon the arts and crafts spirit. Uh, but Henry Booth was also looking at the art deco. And so it has this real jaunty sort of 1929 uh, look to it. And then I love the way that Henry Booth specifies the bricklaying here. The contractor was Albert Wormuth of Fort Worth, who is the same contractor who built all of Cranbrook's institutions. Uh, and so I don't know if they were the same Norwegian bricklayers who built Kingswood, but there is great skill to the brick uh, uh, laying and patterning. Um, and then there are these wonderful tile pieces. Um, these tile pieces date to 1921. They were put here in 1929. They were by Annie Eisenmenger, uh, who was a woman artist working in Austria at the Wiener Werkstätte. And Henry Booth purchased these at the Wiener Werkstätte. Uh, if you know much about Austrian decorative arts, which you should look it up, um, the Wiener Werkstätte was the shop led by um, Josef Hoffmann uh, and was the real sort of center of Austrian art secessionist style design. It is the four seasons. So here we have um, spring with the little children playing. And then here is summer with the oak trees and the bird chirping. Uh, we move one panel over and we see autumn with the grapes and the bird again. And then we get to winter, which is where I feel like we are today, uh, with the two children now no longer lounging or harvesting, but cuddled for warmth. And the little bird is, I don't know, hibernating up there. Really remarkable uh, pieces of Austrian decorative art and I think quite beautifully installed here at the school. Now I'm going to try and peek into the door here um, and we'll see just what the Henry Booth design lobby looked like. Um, you can go online to our digital image database, search Cranbrook Content DM, and you'll be able to see photos of the interior. It's a sort of two-story vaulted space. Uh, we'll, we'll do a tour of the inside one day soon, perhaps. Moving around here, we get to the car turnaround. Uh, realistic in 1929 that this could accommodate most of the cars. Um, of course, that would change over time. It is a perilous sighting of a building. And then one thing that's interesting about what was going on in the meeting house, I mentioned that uh, Henry Booth was teaching Sunday school lessons there uh, in 1918. In 1925 or thereabouts, the Reverend Dr. Samuel Marquis, who had been Henry Ford's religious advisor, and then he was also the rector at St. Paul's Episcopal Church, the, diocese, the, the main church of, of Michigan. Uh, when he retired from that position, George Booth invited him to start a new church here in Bloomfield Hills. And so Dr. Marquis established Christ Church Cranbrook in um, the meeting house before the official uh, construction of the Bertram Goodhue office uh, associates opened in 1929. And of course, the Christchurch Cranbrook is just on the other side of those trees. And so for, uh, from 1904 until today, religion at Cranbrook has always sat at the intersection of Lone Pine and Cranbrook Road, even though it's moved across three corners. Now, Henry Booth adds on the, uh, the gymnasium, the little gym, to the school uh, as part of that 1929 edition. We'll talk about the 1996 edition a little bit uh, in, a, in a few moments. Um, but Henry Booth, he puts his gym here and then he bar buries it down a level below. And so the gym was at the level of the brook. Uh, and then you could look in these windows and look down into the gymnasium. Um, unfortunately, like every Cranbrook schools, we do have an addition on from the 60s that if I could remove, this one doesn't bother me anymore, but uh, it, it is a pretty offensive design when it's put there in the mid-1960s. Um, unlike the Kingswood gym, it has been covered up quite elegantly. Now, when Jessie Winter, when she builds the 1929 edition on, she got her own apartment in the school, and so the headmistress lived in the Brookside building. Uh, shortly after that, this little structure was built to be the headmistress house. Uh, and it was built at the end of the little driveway, again by Henry Booth, architect. And 
the original gates that you see there. Uh, these were all made by Walter Nichols, who was Cranbrook's blacksmith, and these are designs of Henry Booth. And we actually just had returned the original Brookside uh, gates, which you'll notice there are no gates there, and there's still not room really to put them back. Uh, but they had been given away by one of our groundskeepers uh, and made it out to South Dakota. Uh, and so we got a call quite out of the blue saying, do you want these gates? We think they come from Cranbrook. And we said, of course we want them back. Um, and then they showed up equally out of the blue, unannounced, um, on the back of a truck delivering water tanks to Connecticut and they shoved them off onto the side of the road and now I have my Brookside gates back. They had been painted a much more garish shade of green. So next on our little tour here, um, we're walking down Cranbrook Road um, and you'll notice the mill race there. I did forget to turn around and look at the mill house, um, which is a romantic reconstruction of a 19th century mill. So you have brook on one side of the street, there's a brook on the other side of the street. And here is the original um, home of one of Henry Booth's cousin, George Coleman Booth. Um, and this house was designed by Marcus Burroughs, who was the architect again, of the Birmingham Library and who helped design the first, the early additions to the Meeting House. And this was a, a family home until 1947, uh, when it was converted by the Cranbrook Architectural Office into seven apartments. Today it is three apartments and it's used by the Academy of Art for uh, the most junior artist in residence live here, not on Academy Way. And as we're walking through, let me walk back here and just give us a, take a moment to sort of point out where Brookside was by 1961 when Jessie Winter was retired. Uh, she had overseen the construction from the meeting house all the way to the far end of Cranbrook Road, um, all the different additions, the tower. She had her house here. Cranbrook then by that point owned Hedgegate. It was used as apartments. And there was a real need by the uh, late 1980s to expand Brookside. Uh, they wanted to add a pre-kindergarten. They wanted to increase the class size. Um, and there just wasn't any room. And there was all sorts of discussions about just starting the school somewhere else on the campus of converting Hedgegate, the house and apartments here into more classroom space. Um, but Cranbrook was having a little bit of a struggle at the moment with the architect uh, Goya Obata of HOK, who was had planned the Cranbrook vision plan of 1986, uh, and he was going to oversee a number of expansion projects, but the Institute of Science expansion was not going well, uh, and the decision was made to, to uh, get out from uh, the HOK contract, and Dr. Lillian Bowder, who was Cranbrook's um, uh, president at the time, the president of Cranbrook Educational Community, um, she had come from uh, a background in, uh, she had her PhD in early childhood education, sociology, um, and then she came as uh, working for the schools and was promoted into her role as president of Cranbrook. And she was the first president, um, she was the third president, but the first to really take this strong approach of building up Cranbrook and its facilities. Uh, and how would Cranbrook launch into the 20th century. And so using that master plan, she knew that each institution would need to have an addition, would need additional space. But the struggles with the initial architect selection, uh, she formed the Architectural Advisory Council. And this was a group made up of a Cranbrook trustee, Cranbrook's head of the architecture department, a practicing architect, um, and a, a few other members. And then they were, instead of going to just award contracts to whichever architect uh, was afforded or whoever we knew, they were going to stage little architectural uh, invited competitions. And Brookside served as the first architectural competition. And so the architects who they invited out uh, were Stephen Hull, who was a New York architect, who at that point hadn't really built anything huge of note, but was a noted theoretician and artist and designer of beautiful things. Todd Williams and his wife, Billy Chin. Of course, Todd Williams is a graduate of Cranbrook Schools. Uh, Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown, the sort of 
uh, father of postmodernism with his text Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture. And then uh, Peter Rose, who was a Canadian architect who was having a, a bit of a moment at that time, 1991. Uh, he had just opened the Canadian Centre for Architecture. And Stephen Hall came out and he proposed uh, building the new Brookside School actually on this side of the street and then bridging from the old Brookside, leaping across with classrooms across Cranbrook Road and landing over here. The committee thought it was a bold and visionary plan, but that it would never work both legal, uh, sort of logistically but financially. And so Stephen Hall was uh, uh, deemed uh, not appropriate for this project. Todd Williams, they really liked his interview, but then when they uh, went and toured his buildings, they thought, oh, it's a little cold. It's a little too modernistic. So he was knocked down. They loved Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi, and they really thought that's who should build here at Cranbrook. Um, then they did not love Peter Rose. He bombed his interview, but they still were going to visit buildings of each architect. And so they went out to the Canadian Centre for Architecture. And that's when Lillian Bowder said, this is our architect. Because what he had done at the Canadian Centre of Architecture was take a historic house, um, a 19th century house, and then added on an institutional addition. And he balanced technology, building systems, craftsmanship, light, texture materials and she thought that's what Brookside needs. They needs a house architect who can build an institution because Brookside is essentially one large house. The Venturis eventually lose the, the, the competition because um, uh, people who shall not be named sort of throw them under the bus and say Robert Venturi only knows how to build architecture that alludes towards the history, that alludes towards other things. Cranbrook isn't doesn't need to allude towards anything. Cranbrook is the real architecture. And so we end up with the Peter Rose masterpiece, the Early Childhood Center. Uh, and so the Early Childhood Center is fundraising 91, 92, 93, construction 94, 95, and it opens to students in 1996. It's sitting in a landscape by the great modernist Dan Kiley. Uh, and so Dan Kiley used his um, famous cherry blossom trees and then this alley of trees going up. And this was actually what Peter Rose's greatest innovation. He was the only architect who proposed, instead of trying to squeeze the addition behind Brookside and making that traffic turnaround work, he said, you own all of this side of the road, build this traffic circle coming in here. And so Peter Rose... Uh, revolutionized pick up and drop off and he ends up building a whole new facade for Brookside that previously had really been uh, the sort of woods behind the school. Now Dan Kiley is famous for his modernist landscapes. Uh, he was Aero Saarinen's, one of Aero's preferred landscape designers, uh, and he is famous for his grids of trees. A lot of these trees unfortunately have died because they got t they get taken out by school buses turning around. Um, but this is one of Dan Kiley, a, a real modern master of landscape architecture, one of his last works. Then there is the Peter Rose School. And remember I mentioned that he was, what impressed them so much about the Canadian Centre for Architecture was the balance of the handmade and technology. Um, we'll talk about the logjam arch in a moment. And what I love about the Peter Rose building, and I think it really is one of Cranbrook's treasures in it is only its function as a elementary school that keeps me from turning this into Michigan's hottest tourist destination. Uh, you see the way that he uses I-beams, um, sort of standard construction material, and then he welds these little plates in, and it's all supporting these concrete blocks. And you think concrete blocks are not... Um, very Cranbrook. Actually, they are. So Cranbrook House is made of concrete block that's then plastered over. A lot of Tower Cottage and the farmhouse over at the School for Boys. Albert Kahn and the Kahn system of uh, construction uh, was a real pioneer of concrete block construction in the 19 teens or 19 aughts and teens. And so this is as much a Cranbrook material as any other. But I love the way that Peter Rose balances these custom concrete blocks within the bricks that fit uh, really just so beautifully in, in between those uh, concrete blocks there. Then there are the wonderful little handprint concrete blocks and all the handprints are linked back to uh, individual student 
faculty member, our parent. Uh, and then one thing that Peter Rose observed about all of the Cranbrook Brookside construction was that it read like a little village. And so he wanted to continue that idea of having different heights and of having different uh, ways of sort of pushing and pulling the building to create this diversity as you move across the site. And it would still read like the old brook sign, this wonderful sort of warren of hallways and um, pathways and shafts of light. And he even uses different construction techniques. So he uses uh, wooden beam construction some places, steel beams other places, so that all the classrooms are uh, can be multi-purpose, but they all feel different. The architecture always feels different. Uh, and then he hides the sort of hideous 60s gym with this lovely little breezeway here. The tower with its great copper roof. And then if we can look into the window, um, we can see there's also some things from the Cranbrook Boneyard that were used. Oh, my camera light is on, how strange. Um, I don't know why. Uh, so that's actually a piece of the 1888 Trumbull Avenue home uh, of George and Ellen Booth, designed by Mason and Rice Architects, which is where Albert Kahn got his start. Um, uh, we have a number of pieces of the uh, 1888 home at Cranbrook, but that is the only one that has been reincorporated into a Cranbrook building. And that's, there's art throughout the interior of the ECC. There's also the great rear view of the headmistress's house here. And then the stairs leading up past the old gym. Of course, the Dan Hoffman design lights here. Hoffman, again, the head of the architecture department uh, from 1983 to 1996 ish. Uh, and Dan Hoffman designed the log jam arch, which was built here in 1997, constructed by the Cranbrook Architectural Office and the architecture students of the Academy of Art. And it's this real sort of fidgety, um, wonderful combination of wood and structure and galvanized steel bolted together. Uh, and then up above the log jam, you'll notice the logs don't necessarily all touch each other. And it's this sort of system of using tension rods and hooks that are keeping these in place. This, it, it looks almost like a kinetic sculpture going down. And so the, the architecture office and students built furniture on the inside. They built the log jam arch. They also built this, and this was a sort of cost saving me measure, was that as the budget, as it always does, was running over, um, the architect Peter Rose said, well, Dan Hoffman, why don't you and the students build a custom entryway instead of just doing a cheaper entryway, we'll do it ourselves and we'll save money that way. And so this is another piece designed and manufactured by the students. And then as we look inside, uh, we can see Carl Millis's moose looking there. Every Cranbrook building has a Carl Millis sculpture. And the, then some of the other Brookside chairs there. And what I love are the, the, just the irregularities of things like the windows um, down here where you can just picture a little three or four year old looking out saying hello. Uh, and so the, the building just really responds to the scale of the user, um, both the instructor, but I think more importantly, the child. And it has just this wonderful imagination inspiring place. I, I, all of Sarnen's buildings are beautiful and majestic works of high architecture. But Brookside, I think, is just this real incredible accretion of remarkable structures that are much stronger as a whole than any individual piece. Um, as we come down here, of course, this is the Vlasic Early Childhood Center donated by the Vlasic family, which I just was having some Vlasic family product for lunch. Uh, the, and so the Pickle Island is a man-made island here in the River Rouge. And on Pickle Island stands the Pickle Hut. And the Pickle Hut is another Dan Hoffman project, again, made by the architecture students using cedar shake shingles. And the shingles are sort of roughly lined up. Uh, 
galvanized steel up at the top. And then in the early years, uh, because the Booths owned all of this property, um, the children would actually play in the yards back here. So if you look at old historic photos of Brookside, they're always playing and having their recesses out in the yard. Um, today they have the tunnel going over to the main property. And then if you go into the Pickle Island, it has the, the bench where you can sit. And again, this sort of feeling of enclosure versus opening. And so if I sit here, you know, I can't see anything except looking up. But if I was a little kid and you were sitting down, it's sort of like the whole thing is scaled to peeking out of this woodland fort. It's pretty wonderful. And then one of Peter Rose's big pushes as he was designing the early childhood center was to reconnect Brookside with the brook itself. Um, so the Bloomfield Hill School was the name of the school from 1922 until 1930. And Henry Booth suggests renaming it the, from the um, Bloomfield Hill School to Brookside. But what Peter Rose noticed was that the children never saw the brook because they didn't go play across the brook. And so he wanted to bring his building down to the, the water level again. And so he reopens all of the, uh, the classrooms out onto the brook. And I did have public safety come over and unlock the gate for me. So it is not usually unlocked. You see the different types of roof structures so that all the classrooms, um, one thing that the instructors said was that they wanted all the classrooms to be able to change use. So if the music room needed to be something else, the architecture wouldn't impede that. And so what Peter Rose did was he made every roof different and then whatever happens in the classroom can uh, change function over the years. And then here's my gymnasium from the 60s, which I have very little to say about. And then as I move through, grateful that I am not enclosed in my Cranbrook apartment with children. Here you see the back of the Henry Booth building and how it opened up onto the river. And then we see the Marcus Burroughs and George Booth building, the Ram House. And you can see uh, that even back here there are all these interesting details like the two-story glass stairway, the way that Henry Booth turns the bricks different directions. There's the brick cornice line where you see Henry Booth has turned the bricks onto diagonals. Um, no, that is a private house being uh, built across the way. And so now we get back to the, the oldest parts of, of the campus again. So this is back to our mid-1920s. And you see um, here in the actual timber frame structures, the little curve and the plaster work, uh, the, these lovely little wooden details and moldings. And then there is this fabulous concrete turtle which is by um, Jim Mellick Mueller, who is an Academy of Art graduate, who many, many Academy of Art graduates go into functional design. Think of all the car designers that have graduated from Cranbrook Academy of Art are today, the fact that eight students a year go and work for Nike. Uh, but Jim Mellick Mueller is an interesting character because he went into children's play structures and he made his entire career designing children's playthings. And so that's one of his turtles. Uh, you can find a porpoise over at the Boys Middle School, recently a gift from a Cranbrook's uh, supporter. And so finally, we'll end our tour here at the back of the meeting house, which I wanted to bring you over just to be able to show you uh, this really amazing window from Catherine McEwen, uh, the painter from the Detroit Society of Arts and Crafts who painted the frescoes at Christchurch Cranbrook. She did the work on the front of the school. Um, but here is just a real tour de force of American arts and crafts with the barge boards again by Youngworth and the little uh, 
leaded windows. And then we're going through the children's garden, which was designed uh, by the landscape architecture firm Walker Macy, who I think are in Los Angeles, um, and dedicated a number of years ago. Now, the emergency exit uh, actually is a Henry Booth designed and is there by the uh, mid 30s. But then we get to George Booth's design of the meeting house. And this really is George Booth's only complete work of architecture. Um, so George Booth is Cranbrook's founder and he builds this meeting house uh, from 1918. Sorry, I'm trying not to fall off of these little blocks. Uh, so George Booth builds the meeting house again in 1918 using the leftover material from the Cranbrook House West Wing. Uh, and what I love about it is that this, um, the way that the half timbering is, is it's totally illogical. It's just this very romantic idea of here's our little English um, country meeting hall. And so we have the half timbering. Instead of expressing any type of logic structurally, um, they're sort of irregularly placed different angles of, of wooden beams. And then you have the, the front of the meeting house, which you sort of too easily can blow by if you're cruising quickly down Lone Pine Road. Uh, you miss the sort of beauty of the entire construction. The little uh, tunnel that you're seeing there is how the Brookside School's children uh, get back and forth to the play fields that are on the main campus, uh, and that dates to the uh, 1940s. A little sculpture down here. And then you see the original bridge with its funny little bridge topper. And you see the original wall of uh, the, I, I believe this was Grace Wallace Booth, or Grace Booth Wallace's estate. So the Booth daughter who founded Brookside lived there just across the little brook. Okay. So thank you all for joining me for another tour. It's always fun to do uh, these Facebook live tours. Um, I don't ever give tours of Brookside, so it's fun to talk about a structure that usually I mention um, from a tour bus going from Kingswood to the Smith House. Um, if you have other questions, leave them in the comments. We'll look at those. Um, if you have other places that you want our tours to go to, um, I'm always happy to take suggestions. Uh, you can go back in time and you can see my tour of the Cranbrook Art Museum sculpture. Uh, you can also see the tour of Sarnen House and of Kingswood's architecture and ornament. Um, the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research is responsible for stewarding all of these cultural properties and tiles and sculptures. And if you like what you do, if you like these tours, um, go to our website. You can see digital image database. You can see our blog. Uh, you can see essays that we've written. And you can also see a little button that says donate now. And you can help support us um, as we look forward to our tour 20 tour season of 2020 being a completely non-existent. So um, we, of course, there are many different things that need your support now, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, you can help support the mission of Cranbrook and the preservation and interpretation of all these beautiful works of art. Thank you so much for joining me. Again, I'm Kevin Adkison, the curator with the Center. We do this every Wednesday at five o'clock. Uh, Cranbrook is closed. The buildings are closed. I live here on the campus, and so that is why I am doing these tours. We are not having staff travel to and from campus, and you should not either. So please stay home, stay safe, be well. I hope that everyone in your family is doing okay. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us, and I will see you next Wednesday live at 5 here on Facebook.